Hello and welcome to Policy Beast. We're continuing our series of meeting the candidates for the seventh Middlesex seat. Uh, the race is happening, well, right now. And tonight's guest is Jack Lewis from Framingham. Jack, thank you so much for joining us here on Policy Beast at Ashland. Thank you for this opportunity to be on the show. So um, what we're hoping to do tonight is to introduce you to some of our viewers. So I guess the first question I'd like to ask you is, who is Jack Lewis? Excellent. So I am the son of a hardworking union worker and a dedicated preschool teacher that currently works for Head Start in Ohio. Okay. Two parents that taught me to persevere in the face of great opposition. I'm the proud father of a six-year-old who keeps me on my toes, <laughs> who we adopted just a couple years back through DCF foster care. Josiah's changed our world in a way that we didn't initially imagine. Mm. Uh, he currently attends Barbary Public Elementary and is in the Spanish Immersion Program in yes. Framingham. Yeah. I'm an ordained minister by background, and in that capacity, I spent a lot of time preaching on social justice and economic justice issues, mm -hmm. leading youth and service learning trips around the world and locally. Uh, and those things have made me who I am today and have led me to my current capacity of running a nonprofit that I helped start in the capacity of being a local clergy person. Uh, What's that nonprofit? So the nonprofit is Out Metro West. Okay. Uh, it serves LGBT youth in the Metro West area. It's headquartered in Framingham. Okay. We currently run eight programs a month for middle and high school youth. And what kind of programs do you run? So the programs range from very educational to very social. Okay. Uh, the youth. <laughs> Go to school. Like the, the they like part. the social, <laughs> sure. uh, and the donors and supporters love the educational. Of course, uh, but but the youth they go to school, they receive support, and it's actually the youth more often than not that tell us when we need to do something that's not too social in nature. So interesting conversations about healthy relationships, mm -hmm. uh, self defense classes, mm -hmm. some of the great work that's done in local high schools, but there isn't the time or bandwidth to focus on. We're sure. able to do on on Monday nights. So that's a uh, me in a nutshell. How long have you been uh, executive director over at, is it uh, Out Metro Out West? Metro West. Yeah. So the organization started about five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I was serving at the church, Unitarian Church in Wellesley, okay. when a couple parents approached me from the community looking for a supportive space for their recently out gay sons. Okay. And through meetings with community leaders and some focus groups, we decided to launch a program uh, that at the first meeting had 32 youth from 14 towns, mm. and it's now been five years. We've served 650 youth. Wow. And these are youth that are, they're smart, they're wonderful, but unfortunately they're very much high risk mm. uh, for a lot of behaviors. And we are there six times, uh, or eight times a month now, providing supportive programs, advocating for them, working with leadership development, youth empowerment, mm -hmm. advocating for their needs in the community. Uh, so yes important work. Um, Some work. So given your background, you told us a little bit about you know, uh, who you are and where you come from. Why are you running for this seat? Why now? Why, why are you throwing your head in the way? It's a great question. Yeah. I, I think from the beginning, focusing on social justice issues, working mm -hmm. towards a more just and fair world has always been the cornerstone of a lot of my personal and professional decision making. Mm -hmm. and that commitment has led me around the world interacting with people that I otherwise never would have met. It's led us to put solar panels on our roof and mm -hmm. be a habitation assistant for a group home for people with intellectual and dis intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. It led me to go to seminary, get involved in political campaigns. Mm -hmm. It led me to help found this nonprofit. And for the most part, while I've always had a great interest in politics right. and I've always kept that door cracked, mm -hmm. I was content meeting the needs as they arose, trying to do what I could, uh, until we adopted our son. Mm. And it's interesting how another human being in your life that is fully dependent on you for everything mm -hmm. can change your priorities. And how, how, did that, how, did, how, how did that shift occur, that internal shift it's occur for you? Quickly and uh, immediately. Uh -huh. So I think we, we did all the reading that a lot of new parents try to do to prepare sure. ourselves. And to be honest, we weren't fully prepared for what it meant to be parents and how your life would change forever mm. in a great, wonderful way that I would never do differently. Uh, but you're responsible for another human being. And Josiah has changed our lives in a way that I would, I would never go back on. But he serves as a regular reminder that there's so much more to life than meeting issues as they arise. 
Mm. I want to create a world, work to create a world that I will be proud to hand over to him one day, a world that's going to be safe for him and his classmates to exist within today. Mm -hmm. And I think being a minister and working in a nonprofit, a lot of our work is aspirational. We hope mm. to plant seeds that if somebody else waters, maybe long down the road will bear fruit. Mm -hmm. But for me, becoming a parent, that all just became immediate. And when Thomas and Andrew decided he wasn't going to run for re-election, the mm -hmm. opportunity arose. I have spent the last five, six years building connections in Metro West Boston, getting to know the communities mm -hmm. that I would be honored to serve. And I think now is the opportunity. I know now is the opportunity to try to continue the legacy that Tom Santa Candra began uh, and to serve the residents of the 7th Middlesex District. So I want to take it back. And you talked about, um, you know, you've had a, a, long, a long career, really, of service. Uh, and now you're trying to shift that into more of a public service sort of role. And you talked about some of the touched upon some of the social justice issues that matter to you. I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit more to some of those issues and, and, and maybe even talk about some of, some of the other uh, policy issues that you see specifically in Metro West that you're concerned about and maybe inspiring you to run for this seat. Okay, I'll start with actually a policy issue that I think all policy issues by extension can be social justice issues, mm -hmm. but public transportation. Uh, my spouse uses the commuter rail every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, most days it's convenient for my son and I to drive him at six in the morning down to the Framingham commuter rail station. Mm -hmm. And nobody can tell you more than my son about how dysfunctional the commuter rail can be. Uh, and he's six, right? And he's six, okay. yes, because he's, he's there every morning at 6 a.m., <laughs> yeah. 6 20. I think the train comes at 6 40. Mm -hmm. uh, when it snows too much, the trains run slowly, or they don't run at all. Oh, they don't when run it's at too all, hot, they yeah. run slowly. Um, and we're the ones that are there to drop him off with the thousands of other residents of Framingham and Ashland taking these, mm -hmm. uh, this wonderful service into town. The residents of Framingham and Ashland just want to go to work. They want to do what they have to do so they can rush home and be with their family and their friends. Mm -hmm. And we deserve better than a system that's not consistent. Mm -hmm trains run on time around the world in places like Shanghai and Tokyo and Paris, and there's no reason whatsoever when it rains or when it snows or when it's hot that the trains aren't there in Boston and in Framingham and mm -hmm. Ashland. I think there's a problem. We sometimes think about the issues that face our communities mm -hmm. and we want to put band-aids on them. Sure. There are problems that have been there forever. Some of these trains that we ride are as old as I am, if not older. And we try to fix yesterday's problems with 20th century band-aids. I mean, I take it you're not like one or two years old. I'm not one or two years old. Some of these trains, you know, are They're a little the older 80s. than... Yes, yeah, yeah, so. uh, yes, I am. Right, right. Yes, great right. point. Right. I, I'm, I'm a little older than that. Okay, just, um, just, just clarify. No, it's true. <laughs> um, but I think we have a problem where we see... We know there's an issue, but we try to fix it as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, that means we put 20th century band-aids on yesterday's problems, when I think we really need bold 21st century solutions. Well, what would and, be some of the bold 21st century solutions that you would propose for some of our public transportation challenges here in Metro West? Well, one of them is upgrading trains. Yeah. I, I know we're, there's a competition around picking the outside design of the new green uh, green Line trains, right. uh, there's conversations about expanding the stations and we talk and we plan and this is that talking and planning, planting seeds and hoping that the next generation of politicians waters them sure. so that eventually 10 years down the road people who live in these communities without access mm -hmm. can get to work mm -hmm. when around the world in countries you know, as close as Canada and as far as China and Japan realize there's a need for stations and they realize that it's a community need and they build them. Uh, they realize that resources are there and mm -hmm. it's always a conversation about prioritization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that last winter should have been a wake up call for all of us. I think Governor Baker it, has made it a priority and mm -hmm. the weather has been better this winter. So I don't know if it's his prioritization. I don't know or, if this is wood. I don't know if it's wood. <laughs> I as somebody who, as I said, drives uh, most days to and from that those stations uh, to drop off my spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just that's one piece. Yep. I think there's also so much more as a society. We live in Massachusetts. I, 
was not raised in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but we made an intentional choice to move here. When did you move here? So about six years ago, okay. we moved to, to the Metro West area. Uh, relatively new in the grand sense, in the large sense of things, but we made an intentional choice mm -hmm. to move here. We wanted to move to a state where that leads the way. Massachusetts on social issues, on most political issues, mm -hmm. leads the way and the country follows. And that dates back to the Revolutionary War and all the way through marriage equality. Yes, it does. And we wanted to be residents of that state. We chose to move to Framingham because we wanted to raise our future family in a, a global community, mm -hmm. uh, making sure our son knew what it meant to be a global citizen, mm -hmm. attending diverse schools. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't be happier and we couldn't be more proud to be residents of this, the town and the district. Uh, but yes. But transportation is a challenge. Transportation is a challenge. And if we don't want people to get in their cars and drive into Boston and contribute to the traffic along the turnpike, then we need to do something about the regularity and the consistency of the commuter rail. It's hard. Uh, they run every hour uh, sometimes. They run every half an hour other times. It's, it's, a very, it's not a very dependable service. Mm -hmm. And when they're running slow and when trains are delayed, uh, it means that if you're giving yourself a half hour or an hour buffer to get to work, there's a good chance you'll be late. You'll mm -hmm. miss that meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole chunk of last winter where my spouse worked from home for weeks and weeks mm -hmm. because it just wasn't, didn't make sense to go to the train station, wait, to go into Boston, to then turn around and come back four or five hours later. Unfortunately, um, his yes. story is not very unique. No, it's not. Um, uh, and I think we have a responsibility. And if I'm elected to be the representative of residents of Framingham and Ashland, I'd have a responsibility to never forget the stories that I bring to the equation, mm -hmm. but also the stories of the thousands of other people who feel let down by their public transportation system. Well, again, uh, to your point, I think that's something that figured, that does figure prominently in a lot of folks' minds out here. Uh, so what other, um, th there, to your point, almost every policy issue could be observed as a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. Is there, but is there a particular policy issue that we all basically do see and acknowledge as a social justice issue that you're particularly concerned about right now that you'd like to address if you get elected? So I think another way where Massachusetts is leading the way, but more needs to be done is around green energy. I think that we, solar panels are going up all over the place. I, mm -hmm. I love going down the turnpike now and, and seeing the, the new panels. We put our own panels up on our roof maybe three or four years ago now. Okay. Massachusetts residents are realizing that they can become more energy independent, that they can contribute to the energy, green energy revolution and lower their electric bills mm -hmm. by leasing out their roofs. It's huge, but we need to do more. Mm -hmm. I think we need to continue to think creatively around about ways to remove our dependency on fossil fuels. But Jack, gas prices at this taping are so low. It's true. Like, why should I be concerned about this? Because I'm saving money and, you know, I don't care. Today, and I think that, that <laughs> today. today that is true. <laughs> yeah. uh, our gas prices fluctuate depending yeah. on what's going on in the Middle East, and we're fortunate right now that Saudi Arabia is lowering gas prices because they're concerned that Iranian oil is going to flood the market as a mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. there are issues that we have no control over whatsoever. Right. Uh, what, four years, oh, two years ago now, gas prices were like 325, 350. Um, and you had to bring that up now. We had, I'm, yes, like, so now I'm sad we, again, so. <laughs> memories are short. Memories, memories are short. short. Yeah. Uh, it's winter, it's, those yeah. of us use oil to heat our houses. Oil's sure. cheaper, yep. um, but when things are cheaper is when we need to invest in alternatives because we don't know when our dependency on foreign oil is not gonna be working to our advantage. Mm -hmm. And when those oil prices are gonna go up, when the gas prices are gonna go up, uh, so now is the time when things are cheaper and we're all saving a little money to make the investments. And with a lot of these Massachusetts-based solar companies. I was going to say, what kinds of investments would you, would you recommend? What, what, what kind of investments would you stand behind as a state rep? I think we need to continue the tax incentives. I think we need to continue to allow for and encourage the startup solar companies that have sprung up a lot I don't, of the last five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think I forget how many thousands, maybe 12,000 uh, Massachusetts residents are currently employed uh, by the solar companies. Uh, Massachusetts residents who live in houses that don't have trees blocking them have wonderful access to put solar panels on. It's cheap, it's inexpensive. I sound like I'm a salesperson for, for one of these companies. Does that say, are you um, getting commission for that? I, I have to look at my old contract with, uh, with the company. Uh, but no, that's huge. The, right. the solar panels along the turnpike 
They're there now. Sure. They weren't there a year ago. No, they, they weren't. They weren't there five years ago. Nope. It has to be incentivized, mm -hmm. that, especially as gas prices are cheap. Our dependency on foreign fuels, dependency on fossil fuels, mm -hmm. unless we incentivize it, we're going to continue to be dependent on what we've grown accustomed to. And that's a very and good I point because if there's no if there's no impetus, if there's no reason for me to be thinking about things down the road, I'm going to unfortunately be thinking about what's in front of me right now. And I know that um, and I'm not, you know, saying that you know, this is something that that, that uh, you know, people don't do. They do it all the time. I mean, I do it too. You you see that gas is a little cheaper? You're like, "Great. I can, you know, do other things. I can provide you know, other things for my family. I have a little bit more flexibility. It's like, you know, we'll just keep this, keep this. Why would this change? And then it, it changes. And then you're like, oh my goodness. Yes, like you're accustomed. Now, yeah. And then now what am I going to do? Because now I got to pay all my money for fuel. And so looking at it in more of a long term rather than yes. short term context is, is a strategy that you're advocating for. for yes. Green and I think, this point. you know, those of us with children who want to make sure that the town and the community and the larger environment that our kids inherit mm -hmm. is one that we're proud of. Right. That it's, it's not just reducing and recycling. Those things are all important. Sure. But we need to think creatively and we need mm -hmm. to think of what's the equivalent that my grandparents thought of in the 50s with the uh, interstate highway system. Like, what's mm. the equivalent of putting somebody on the moon like in the say you're at, you're, It's almost like a call for a NASA type yes. movement. You're looking for that sort of grand social movement towards, you know, renewable resources, yes. resources and alternative energy, because that's what it's, I mean, I, I, I do agree with you. I think that's what it's going to take. Yes. Um, it, it's just not going to organically, as it were, you know, just bubble up. I, I think it's going to take focused policy mm -hmm. and purpose uh, because, uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's, it's kind of difficult to focus on what's coming on down mm -hmm. the line, especially if you've got stuff in front of you that seems to be working pretty yes. well. And I'm not, you know, uh, making fun of or, no, no. Or, or, or anything like that, but folks who, who are kind of thinking, because we all, to a certain extent, sometimes have to think day to day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think that, especially with the green energy mm -hmm. issue, that's something that's very important to, to think about. And Massachusetts has done great work, but if we don't continue to reach for what's next, states like California will leapfrog ahead of us. Countries around the world are that. investing. We, can't, we definitely can't have that. <laughs> but countries around the world are investing this in a way that we, as a commonwealth and we, as a larger nation, aren't yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to find us as a commonwealth treading water in yesterday when the rest of the world is moving into tomorrow. Uh, so that would be one of my one of my commitments mm -hmm. uh, as a state rep. One of the issues that is of great concern to many people, not just in Metro West, uh, and not just in Massachusetts, but regionally and nationally as well, is the opiate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've had a lot of uh, policymakers, even presidential candidates in New Hampshire, addressing this issue. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, positions or uh, opinions um, or even some ideas about what we can do to address this crisis, which doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon, no. unfortunately. And I think the conversation has shifted, and I, I'm actually quite happy with the shift in conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from Governor Baker and the presidential candidates all the way down is that we're talking about it as an issue that doesn't relate, isn't just about the them, and we from the safety of our papers and our kitchens are reading about the other. We're right. talking about it as a community crisis, mm -hmm. which it is and always has been, mm -hmm. and we all, the degrees of separation aren't great. Right. The people that are struggling are our parents, there are aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, grandkids, there are our own kids. Right. It's not somebody else's issue that we can safely stand back and think about. And I've been really excited by what I've heard from Governor Baker actually, talking about uh, what needs to happen as a society where we need to shift from just punishment to, uh, to rehab, to helping people be where they need to be, uh, and thinking of it as a community crisis, not as an individual crisis, mm -hmm. because it touches everyone. Uh, and so some of the conversations that are happening on Beacon Hill, I'm fully supportive of a lot of the ideas discussed, limiting well, prescription to drugs to so, three days. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can only get a three-day prescription, limiting how many prescription drugs are out there in the world, okay. uh, having greater access to Narcan, uh, in mm. schools and in community centers. Uh, so when people overdose, an overdose isn't the end of one's life, but with these life-saving uh, drugs, it could be an opportunity to pivot and start anew. Uh, 
there are conversations around so three-day waiting period. Uh, there's a proposal and some negotiation happening around if doctors can admit people uh, who are in the midst of being addicted and doctors are fearful for their safety and health if they can involuntarily uh, admit them to treatment facilities. I'm okay. not saying that I think these are larger conversations that need to happen, mm -hmm. but I'm happy that they're happening. There isn't, there aren't easy solutions. I think step one is that we as a society shift and realize it's a community crisis. Right. And then there are some technical fixes, limiting how many like, narcotics are out there, sure. how many days supply one can get. And then there are the larger uh, cultural shifts that have to happen. Like what? I, well, one of them's already happening, how we think of how we think of this. Okay. And then how we think of people who are addicted and how we refer to them, how we refer a, to yeah. that process. Mm -hmm. uh, the headline a couple weeks back about Governor Baker saying it's a, it's a disease, we need to talk about it as treatment of a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a step in the right direction. Decades back, uh, tough on crime, we would send people to jail, send people to prison, make it very hard for them to get driver's license when they get out of prison for, right. I think it's a five year period. Mm -hmm. This is shifting. If we want people to survive, to be healthy, if we acknowledge that these are not some other group of people, but they're, they're our family, they're our friends, right. then we would treat them differently than if they were some other group. And I, the societal shift is that, where we okay. acknowledge where people are no longer embarrassed or afraid to acknowledge that this touches us all. And when we say that, when we say this touches us all, it's a community issue, then we as a community can talk about how we address it, not by punishing people more than we historically have, but by working with people to make sure that they survive, mm -hmm. that they receive the support they need, mm -hmm. and hopefully on the other side, they can join society in a way that most of us want to be a part of society. Uh, and so I think great progress is happening. I love the change of tone that's happened. Mm. And I think now it's what are the immediate technical fixes and then how can we lay the groundwork for a future shift. But through that all, people are dying. And that's right. where things like Narcan can help be a, a small technical fix of how can we get people to the next step. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, I think removing the stigma is very important because I think once you do that, people are more likely to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just that, you know, they just need help, but they're, for some reason or another, well, because it's the, the stigma that's involved, they just feel ashamed or they feel that they can't or they can't tell their families or they can't reach out. And so, you know, before you even get to the point where you need to get somebody help for an overdose, mm -hmm. I think by, by changing the conversation around that, uh, that in and of itself is a preventive step, yes, yes. Um, you know, to uh, try to folks help, help folks who are struggling with this horrible disease. Mm -hmm. So, um, but a, a terrible issue. We don't have too much time left, Jack, but I do want to ask, I got to try to squeeze another issue no, in if I can. Um, I, and there are so many, uh, but uh, one last issue that you're uh, primarily concerned about uh, as a candidate for the seventh middle sex, what, what's, what's another policy issue that, uh, that weighs heavily upon your mind as you uh, prepare to run for office? So uh, I'm somebody who's very committed to the intellectual disability community mm -hmm. uh, and developmental disabilities. I, from a very, very young age, I, it's a, sort of a personal story, but uh, my mother's first child uh, had Down syndrome. And while she didn't survive adolescence, I actually didn't have a chance to, to meet her. Her life touched our whole families. Mm. And I think shaped, I, I know, shaped the narrative and has led me to where I am today. Uh, my mother raised us to celebrate diversity and not just diversity around people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but all diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that commitment led me to work in a group home uh, through high school and in seminary, worked at a, a facility orchestrating service groups, high school service groups coming in, not to provide this very top-down service, but to work with this community mm -hmm. of several hundred people uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities who in this opportunity, we're able to teach youth uh, while also wow. interact and be provided the services they, they require and they deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, as I went through school, I've had opportunities 
part of one summer I worked at a school for people with disabilities outside of Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, wow. A wonderful experience, not, not something that a lot of uh, college uh, students do. No. Uh, but I loved it for lots of reasons. But one of them being that I didn't know a lot of Arabic. I was sort of fish out of water. Okay. And these, you know, these, they were all students, all youth, uh, who for most of their life have been told that they're not smart enough, there's mm -hmm. something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. This was a specialized school working with them. There wasn't, you know, we're not talking about integrated classrooms in okay. Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and they have this, this person who acknowledges he doesn't know very much, um, who struggles with basic pronunciation of Arabic words and phrases. And I learned a lot uh, personally, but in those experiences where they could be the teacher for me, um, it was important for me and I knew to acknowledge that piece, but to have them pivot in the classroom and be able to teach me, to correct me with a smile, um, has shaped a lot of my focus in this community. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to make sure that the state budget fully funds uh, the programs that are necessary, the Turning 22 program, the housing, mm -hmm. the funding that's required to provide housing, to assist with housing. Uh, it's a community that needs people not just to, active, act, to be activists for it, but mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would love to continue that legacy of Santa Candros uh, and bring my own personal experience and my own professional experience to making sure that's not an issue that any of us ever forgets. Well, Jack, we've had such a wonderful conversation over the past 30 minutes. I just wanted to thank you again for coming on the show. Um, I asked this question of all of, my, all of my visiting candidates and I asked you to be succinct, which is great because again, we've got some limited time, but if you had to give one reason why someone should vote for Jack Lewis, what would it be? As state rep, I would never forget to represent the people of Ashland and Framingham. I am committed, my, I have special interests. I, candidates go spend a lot of time trying to convince people they do not have special interests. Mm -hmm. I have special interests. My special interests are the youth of this Commonwealth who are stressed and a lot is asked of them more than ever before. My special interests are those people who are at the commuter rail station every morning at 640 who just want to get to work and home to be with their families. My special interests are those people with disabilities who deserve the support from the state and need, an need somebody to, active to be an activist with them at the state house. My special interests are kids in DCF foster care who, through no fault of their own, just need a le little extra support. I would be honored to be a state rep for these two wonderful, beautiful, diverse towns. And I hope over the next seven, eight, nine months to meet folks in the district and have continue these conversations that we started today. Jack, I think that's a great way to leave it. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much for appearing on Policy Beast. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Policy Beast as we continue to interview the candidates for the seventh middle sex seat. Again, thank you so much, Jack Lewis, for being on the show this evening. And thank you for watching. Thank you.